It is important for Biomeria to recognize World Sepsis Day in order to help raise awareness of this important global medical issue. Diagnostics is power. In this case, we believe that diagnostics have the power to help save lives from sepsis. This is Janice Zimmerman, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the 15th session of the World Sepsis Congress. Uh, there are over 16,000 uh, participants registered for the Congress, representing more than 150 countries. I'd also like to thank uh, the exclusive sponsor of this session, which is BioMiro. Uh, today. And what we're going to be covering this afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are, is improving awareness, national and global strategies. Our first speaker uh, is a pre-recorded session, so there will not be time for any questions and answers since uh, Dr. Didier Pate is um, otherwise committed. Uh, but Dr. Pate is representing the World Health Organization. He's hospital epidemiologist and Director of the Infection Control Program and World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Patient Safety at the University of Geneva Hospitals and Faculty of Medicine in Geneva. He is the lead advisor of the World Health Organization Clean Care is Safe Care and the African Partnerships for Patient Safety Programs. And he will be talking this afternoon on the World Health Organization Hand Hygiene Campaign and why it is successful. WHO Hand Hygiene Campaign. Why is it so successful? First of all, I would like to thank Conrad for the challenging question. Welcome to the hospital. Infections are waiting for you at the entrance door of the hospital and will certainly complicate your hospital stay. But what is the burden of disease? Hospital infections numbers. At least half a million patients are getting infections every day in the world. Over a year, 16 million deaths will occur only because of healthcare associated infections. This is more than malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS together. Importantly, no hospital, no country, no healthcare system in the world can claim to have solved the problem. By chance, hand hygiene is the solution. We used to say hand washing. However, compliance with hand washing practices remained very, very low for many, many years. At the University in 1992-1993, and based on a study that we conducted in 1994, we actually defined why it was so difficult for healthcare workers to wash hands with soap and water and propose a switch. The main reason for the poor compliance with hand washing was time constraint. Time is a major obstacle for hand hygiene compliance. Washing your hands with soap and water takes too much time. And thus, we proposed to actually replace soap and water hand washing with alcohol-based hand rubbing. Hand rubbing takes only 15 to 20 seconds and acts very fast. It's much more powerful. It's better for your hands. And of course, there is no resistance to alcohol, whereas there is resistance to soap. Thus, 
we proposed a system change. We proposed that alcohol-based hand rub would become the standard of patient care. System change means replacing soap and water hand washing with systematic recourse to alcohol-based hand rubbing, with a few exceptions including the fact that hands could be sold. To introduce and mobilize healthcare workers, we used a multimodal behavior change strategy. The strategy was made of a change in education, the use of workplace reminders, safety culture introduced into the institution around hand hygiene performance, the practice of monitoring hand hygiene performance and feedback of this performance to healthcare workers as published in the Lancet in 2000 and the results as they appeared in the publication with the increased compliance with alcohol-based hand rubbing over time in orange on the slide that markedly explained for the change in behavior and the change in improving compliance. In parallel, we monitor hospital-wide nosocomial infections or healthcare-associated infections and observe a reduction of 50% of these infections associated with a marked reduction around 80% of antimicrobial resistance spread. In addition, when we look at eight years follow-up, we could demonstrate the cost effectiveness of the strategy. In summary, our multimodal behavioral change strategy includes system change, education, monitoring and performance feedback, workplace reminders, and safety culture. The paper published in The Lancet was also called the Geneva Model of Hand Hygiene Promotion. It was reproduced with success all over the world between 2002 and 2005 in single hospitals, multiple hospitals, as well as in national promotion campaigns. Up to 2005, when the World Health Organization asked us whether we could imagine to have this campaign worldwide, and that was the first global patient safety challenge aimed at reducing healthcare associated infections. For these, we developed implementation strategy linked to tools for action at the point of care. Among those tools for actions is the My Five Moment for Hand Hygiene at the point of care, recognized universally as the most powerful to change practices. The My Five Moments were translated into several languages and were also adapted. As you can see, change in color in Australia, in blue, a flower in Korea, and suddenly Playmobil in Argentina, Olaf in Germany, and Hello Kitty in Japan were promoting hand hygiene. This is actually what you call adapt to adopt. And this is very important because when you want healthcare workers to adopt a new strategy, they need to adapt. And for those interested, you can access my TEDx talk on the topic www.tinyurl.com slash adapt to adopt. We do have evidence of successful implementation of the strategy worldwide. From modern healthcare settings to settings with limited resources in a very multicultural environment and ensuring universal system change. In fact, in this hospital in Bangladesh, it is very clear that they cannot buy 
the alcohol-based hand rub solution. In the spirit of equity and solidarity, we developed the WHO alcohol-based hand rub formulation and provide a guide to the local production of the license-free formulation. And here is my friend Lozemi Bengali in his very modest pharmacy hospital in Mali, in Africa, producing locally the alcohol-based hand rub solution at very low cost. My friend Lozemi also went during the Ebola epidemic to teach and coach other pharmacists in Liberia and Guinea and Sierra Leone in order to produce alcohol locally. Last but not least, there are sugar factory and in this case a wonderful sugar factory producing sugar in Uganda and producing also alcohol-based hand rub with the leftovers from the sugar can that allow local production at low cost. Last but not least, in 2014, WHO included alcohol-based hand rub within the WHO essential medicines list. What are the tools to ensure sustainability of the solution worldwide? In fact, we developed in 2010 the hand hygiene self-assessment framework, which is a scoring system whereby every hospital in the world can score the, the institution for the capacity to develop and actually promote hand hygiene. And on the next slide, this slide shows the WHO hand hygiene self-assessment framework average overall score in 2011 and 2015, overall in blue around the world, and by WHO region, and as you can see, it improved all over. My advice to you would be to take part to the 2019 Hand Hygiene Self-Assessment Framework Global Survey to monitor the capacity of your institution to promote hand hygiene. For the best capacities and the best institution, you can also go for the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award information at www.hhea.info, whereby if you get selected, experts will be visiting your hospital and assess your capacity to promote hand hygiene. My advice to you would be, be the next Hand Hygiene Excellence Award Hospital. Our institution has become the WHO Collaborating Center for Patient Safety and we are in charge of this campaign for many years. What are the lessons learned from that? Why did it work? Let me summarize it for you. What did we use? System change. Multimodal evidence-based. We also introduced an experience-based implementation. The strategy was top to bottom as, as well as bottom up. We use tools for implementation. We link to positive outcomes. We reward success and excellence. And we involve patients and their relatives. Many of you will ask you, but what else did you use? The next slide summarizes for you that we use simplification, co-creation, creativity, community experience, adaptation, silo busting, sharing economy principles, and the use of social media. How do you mobilize in infection control? Let's mobilize healthcare workers. In 2015, we say join us for safe hands. And we received many, many of you from all around the world. In 2016, we say let's join hands for safe surgical care. And again, we received many, many of you around this campaign. In 2017, we say fight antibiotic resistance. It's in your hands. We also received a lot of you participating into this campaign. The next slide is showing you the results of the overall global impressions of the campaign, 
from 2015 to 2017 from 55 million people to 248 million. Large campaign. What about 2018? It's in your hands. Prevent sepsis in healthcare was the campaign logo and continues to be. It's in your hands. Prevent sepsis in healthcare was the campaign logo and still is the campaign logo for 2018. We proposed people to sign on board and participate to the campaign. And I was very successful and we are looking for the definitive number of the campaign. Let's mobilize stakeholders. We did it for many years using private organizations for patient safety and hygiene. With these organizations that are promoting patient safety and hand hygiene, providing many posters, providing action and action tools. We then say, let's mobilize patients. Here is a patient asking for safe hands. Here is the family of the patient asking for safe hands. Here is Mary asking for safe hands during home care to grandmother and grandfather. We then mobilize governments. On the map of the world, you can see that more than 140 countries are committed to address healthcare-associated infections since the beginning of the campaign, covering for more than 90%, 95% of the world population. Let's mobilize leaders. Get help by a book, Clean Hands, Save Lives, translated in many different languages and published according to the economy of peace. Also, by the help of leaders, including Bill Clinton, Pelé, and Pope Francis. Finally, let's mobilize communities by having patients participating into hand hygiene promotion, help by volunteers while they are waiting for the doctors or their nurse. And last but not least, our new campaign, Let's Turn Africa Orange, whereby children are participating into covering the of Africa. Let's turn Africa orange. I will conclude by saying thanks again, Conrad, for the challenging questions. Campaign in all is ongoing. For those who want to follow up, access our Twitter accounts, Didier Peter, Global Pops, WHO, and access our website to find all the material for the campaign. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that presentation. Since uh, that was pre-recorded, uh, we have no capacity for questions. So we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Nick Metten Unal. He is professor of anesthesiology and reanimation at Ankara University Medical Faculty, and he's training coordinator for the intensive care super specialty program in Ankara Medical Faculty. He is also past president of the Turkish Society of Intensive Care and an ambassador uh, for the Global Sepsis Alliance. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Zimmerman, for this uh, kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everybody joining to this session from all over the world. It's really a big pleasure for me to be invited to such a big and excellent organization second time. Thanks a lot to organizers, especially to Global Sepsis Alliance. Do you, during my speech, I will concentrate on three headings. Where are we now, what we did, what we do, and what should we do on sepsis education in Turkey? First heading is where are we now? I would like to summarize the results of our recent study published in Critical Care on the sepsis epidemiology in Turkish ICUs. Nearly 1,500 patients from 132 ICUs of uh, 94 hospitals were included to study. At least one infection was pres present at 58% of the study patients. At least, uh, uh, and 54% and, and, and of these infections were nosocomial infections acquired in hospital or ICU. 
there may, there may be several reasons of high nosocomial infection rates. Unfortunately, Turkey is world leader in antibiotic consumption rates within 70, 76 countries, according to a recent publication. It has been very well shown that increasing antibiotic consumptions result in resistance increase and mortality increase related with infections. And it should always be taken into account. Intensive care units are the units that best show the mistakes made in the treatment of infections in the country in all levels. Sepsis prevalence in our study was around 30%. Sepsis prevalence, uh, this very high sepsis prevalence in our ICUs uh, is higher than other European intensive care units. For example, in a recent retrospective German study evaluating 14,000 ICU patients, sepsis prevalence was around 9%. 0.5%. Mean mortality rate in our study for severe sepsis and septic shock uh, was 63%, which was higher than several studies. Low awareness, late admission to hospital and intensive care, late uh, diagnosis and treatment, uh, inadequate number of trained ICU personnel, inadequate quality of care, high and inappropriate anti antibiotic uh, consumption and high resistance, compliance deficit to sepsis treatment protocol may be among the causes of high infection and nosocomial infection rates, high sepsis prevalence and high mortality rate in our study. In 2016, a group of Ankara University Faculty of Medicine students investigated the level of awareness of sepsis in the capital city of Turkey, in Ankara. About 1,700 people attended the survey and the level of awareness was only 11%. Awareness level of Ankara was lower than the several countries. However, we think that these would be lower if all cities of Turkey were evaluated. This year, another group of uh, Ankara University Faculty of Medicine students investigated sepsis awareness and knowledge level of first, third, and fifth years of medical students. Around 7,000 students from 30 medical faculties in 22 cities participated in the survey. A total of uh, 6,900 uh, 6, students responded to the questions of having already heard of the sepsis statement. Of the first year students, Approximately 84% had never heard of sepsis statement, which may partially reflect the public's awareness of sepsis rather than medical faculty students. Unfortunately, 65% of medical school students hear sepsis for the first time in medical faculties. After medical faculties, most popular inf information source for sepsis were social media, internet, and healthcare professionals, as our previous study. During medical education, sepsis training is performed in many departments. Nevertheless, considering that the sepsis is a basic public health problem, and family medicine specialists are the first experts to encounter septic patients, it's seen that the emphasis of sepsis should be increased in these departments. However, on the other side, an integrated curriculum for sepsis should be mandated. So we can save the time of students in addition improvement of sepsis education. 
On the other hand, the training on the sepsis should be increased in the departments where intensive care is supra supra speciality. Only 24% of the students who had previous, uh, previously heard of sepsis knew the current definition of sepsis. The rest uh, mark different definitions. Fifth year students who have identified the correct definition of sepsis have marked that they learn it mainly at emergency medicine, pediatrics, general surgery, anesthesia and reanimation, uh, and internal medicine clinics. The low rate of learning of current sepsis definition, especially at practically very important departments like family medicine, like public health, like, like cardiovascular surgery or neurology departments were striking. Incorrect response rates about sepsis definition, pathogenesis, and clinical presentation were between 10 to 60 percent in survey. Despite this, the, the, the decrease in the rate of the wrong answer in the following years, it was seen that the wrong answer rate of fifth year students was higher than expected. Incorrect response rates for association of sepsis with infection, with organ dysfunction, with inflammatory response, and with leukocytosis or leukopenia were 8, 17, 15, and 13 percent, respectively. Finally, 75 percent of the students thought that they did not have in our sepsis training during medical, uh, medical education. Those results show us new focus area for education. What the, we did and what we do. In cooperation with Minister of Health between 2014 and 2017, Turkish Society of Intensive Care Trainers held training sessions in 800 hospitals with reputation in almost all cities of Turkey. At these meetings, 45,000 healthcare professionals, including 22,000 doctors, were trained for sepsis awareness, diagnosis, and treatment. These activities will continue. This year, after July, the, the 2,430 district of Rotary began to work on rising awareness of sepsis in collaboration with GSA and TSIC. The aim is to rise the awareness of Rotarians, Rotaracts, and Interacts in the beginning, and then the awareness of people in the region containing eight countries. In fact, the sepsis awareness campaign is in line with four of the six focus areas of the Rotary. These are saving mothers and children, supporting education, fighting against the disease, providing clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. For this reason, the 2,430 district sepsis campaign is more likely to expand with the participation of non-regional Rotary clubs and other Rotary districts. Some of the necessary materials for awareness have been prepared and shared, and several meetings were already held, uh, and these will, meetings will increase next week. What should we do? In the New York State, after the Rory Regulation, draft bill on the provision of sepsis lessons to all students, including kindergartens, were accepted. Why not for our countries? What should we do more? Submission of the results of our study on sepsis epidemiology to Minister of Health and asking precautions for it. Secondarily, submission of sepsis awareness and knowledge evaluation study, study to the Council of Higher Education and the Turkish Board of Medical Specialties for demanding necessary applications. What should we do more? 
we should concentrate on education in every level and in every area. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Unal. Um, um, I was just, I have a question for you, which is, you've done a lot of education. Can you identify any one type of education that was more effective in your dissemination of the information? I'm not sure about it. Uh, why? Uh, because initially, we, we did some surveys. Uh, within next year, possible, we will perform new uh, surveys. And according to surveys, I can respond your uh, questions. Uh, I, I can ask for it. But uh, my opinion that uh, when we have a look to the uh, results of our, of our surveys, people are generally getting information from social media, internet, and TV. But social media and internet are very important. Therefore, we should put pressure on it. Also, healthcare professionals are very important. People are getting information also from them. But uh, we have uh, not enough education uh, for them. Therefore, we should improve healthcare personnel's education in addition to medical faculty curriculum. We should change uh, sepsis curriculum in the faculties. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any other further questions, so we'll move on uh, to our next speaker, who is Dr. Denise uh, uh, Cardo. She's originally from Brazil. She's representing the Center for Disease Control and Prevention today. She is director of the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion and National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at CDC. She leads their activities to prevent infections and antimicrobial resistance in healthcare settings and to promote healthcare safety. And she's going to speak with us today about the CDC's uh, activities uh, in the realm of sepsis. Thank you uh, for the introduction. As you know, sepsis is the final path of an infection that was not prevented. There is a lot of things that can be done, not only to prevent sepsis, but also its consequences. And what I want to focus today is what we're doing at CDC um, for uh, not only prevent infections, but also to focus in the, what we're doing to reduce the impact of uh, sepsis and its consequences. Uh, one piece that is very important for us in doing that is to address is to uh, address the sepsis uh, burden and uh, to really look at prevention strategies, not only for reducing the, the burden, but also mortality and complications. And very, very important is to promote sepsis early recognition and, um, and also unifying the sepsis messages with other messages we have, including related to antibiotic resistance, uh, so we don't create confusion when we talk about uh, sepsis initiatives and the stewardship initiatives. So in 2016, um, we published a study showing that sepsis begins outside hospital in 80% of the patients in the United States. And seven in 10 patients with sepsis had um, recent interaction with healthcare providers or chronic conditions that require frequent medical care. This was very important for us because it reflects important opportunities for the management of conditions that can lead to sepsis and also for early recognition of sepsis. And then in 2017, we uh, use data available in electronic medical records to an objective surveillance definition to estimate the burden of sepsis, and that's when the number of 1.7 million cases of sepsis among adult patients with nearly 270,000 deaths uh, was uh, the number that we are using. But not only the number is high, Another piece that is very important is 22% of the patients with sepsis did not survive their hospitalization or went to hospice. And sepsis was present in nearly one-third of all hospitalizations that culminated in death. So 
we, as part of this collaboration, we develop a tool the hospitals can use to track sepsis in their institutions and also to check the impact of their programs and target the sepsis programs. So it's something that we heard it was very important that it could really promote um, more effective interventions in uh, hospitals. And you can have access to that on our website. As part, uh, we heard very clearly from experts in the field and many patient representatives about the need to educate all of us about sepsis. And uh, as part of the publication I mentioned earlier, we also recognize sepsis as a medical emergency and have a call for action to think sepsis, act fast, and reassess. In addition to that, last year we released a campaign that is called Get Ahead of Sepsis that has the same messages, emphasizes the importance of sepsis, early recognition, timely treatment, and reassessment. We, um, uh, in some of my slides, I have the core messages that we uh, are delivering to healthcare professionals that include that they need to be familiar with the existing guidelines in their facilities, that they need to learn that they need to start antibiotics as soon as possible, and really with the key point that they need to treat sepsis as a medical emergency. Same way with patients and families, the message was for them to talk to their doctors or nurses about what they can do to prevent infections, but also to learn about the symptoms of sepsis and delivering the same message that time matters and they should act fast and really go immediately to talk, to, to call for help if they had any of the symptoms uh, that could be sepsis. Uh, in the next slide, um, I have examples of uh, materials that uh, were produced for the campaign, but it's important to note that many materials were downloaded and we had also huge uh, social media engagement. But one piece I want to say is that it's not a just a one-time campaign, it's just not a one-time message. It's something that we need to continue to do on a regular basis. Uh, having the month, of um, sepsis awareness is important. And, uh, and this week, we just released uh, new materials and the toolkits. We have uh, materials for EMS, for the ones who deal with emergency uh, medical responses, and um, in ambulances, and, uh, but also translation of many materials to Spanish. So CDC will continue to work to better understand the epidemiology of sepsis and to improve the prevention and clinical outcomes. We are expanding our work for pediatric populations so we can better understand not just the burden, but risk factors and things we can do to have a major impact, including neonatus. We're also looking at special book groups or, med or medical settings in which Early recognition of sepsis or early interventions can be very, very critical. And uh, in assessing the risk factors that can we really have some impact in terms of uh, changing some of them so we decrease the risk of uh, patients getting sepsis. We continue to engage with healthcare professionals, patients, and their families to recognize the signs of sepsis and to take action. And we continue to, as part of all this, to encourage infection prevention, either through vaccination, infection control, like you heard in other presentations. One point that is critical for us is that we are integrating sepsis goals with other CDC work, not just in infectious diseases, but when we talk about diabetes, when we talk about management of chronic conditions. So not only the infectious diseases or the intensivists will be familiar with sepsis, but all practitioners will be thinking about sepsis when it's needed. I have a slide uh, that talks about how we're looking at um, everything from the prevention to of infections to the early detection of sepsis to appropriate treatment. That is really thinking holistically how we protect patients 
And we believe that all initiatives to protect patients need to be complementary to each other, in addition to have its own focus. So we really help clinicians and patients to know exactly what to do to uh, not just better detect sepsis, but also incorporate that in everything that is going on. My final slide includes um, pictures of people who have suffered sepsis and why the numbers are very important, but we need to remember they represent our loved ones. And one thing that I encourage all of you to do is to partner, to listen to patients and their families because they know how much sepsis can impact their lives. Each story will allow us to address the problem, not only to prevent deaths, but also to support uh, the survivors. So they are the reason we are here today, and they need to be engaged and uh, in all the activities that we're doing for prevention of sepsis, early recognitions, and better management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cardo. Um, I do have some questions for you. Um, one is, how are you going to be assessing the effects of all of these um, interventions, the public campaign? So for the public campaign, we do have an evaluation in terms of not just the number of materials and everything, but also are we changing knowledge? And it's not just based on our evaluation, but also based on evaluations that other groups um, related to sepsis are doing and, uh, and really seeing how much we are changing the knowledge of the, the, popula the general population, but also clinicians. We also want to be uh, targeting specific groups, like I said. We're looking for uh, places where you have high-risk patients and also have uh, target interventions, not just with education, but with specific tools to see if they improve uh, the management of sepsis. We're not looking as uh, outcome in terms of uh, deaths. We're really, at this point, looking at how we can, uh, for the edu educational part, how we can better, uh, if we're really changing uh, the knowledge and, uh, and the actions about sepsis. For the other, uh, not just our interventions, but interventions overall, we plan to continue to uh, assess the burden using um, similar definitions we used before and, uh, and to see if we're seeing decreases not just in sepsis, but also in mortality. Okay. Uh, another question. I know CDC is um, really uh, starting to participate with uh, education with sepsis only in the recent past. So what strategy do you think others can use to persuade organizations like CDC to get interested in sepsis and support these efforts? What, what did it take to get CD on, CDC on board? Do you know? And that's the reason for my last slide, because we all thought about sepsis as um, the um, outcome of infections that were not prevented or managed, and it was more like a clinical. And, uh, and the families of uh, people who died of sepsis were the ones who were critical to highlight to us that that was not enough, and also to highlight to us that there was a need for better uh, acknowledgement and about the problem and the fact that it is a medical emergency. And so that was the reason, uh, that was really the motivation for us to really not just start doing that, but start doing that in an effective way, in a fast way, and really with partners who are already very involved in sepsis. So it's how we can accelerate the process. And that's what I say for public health agencies like CDC or other agencies. Don't try to reinvent, but play a role in how you can really help accelerate the process. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your answers to those questions, Dr. Cardo.
So we'll move on to our uh, next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Karen uh, Staunton, and uh, he's representing the Rory Staunton Foundation. Uh, he is the face of the Rory Staunton Foundation in Washington in New York State. And as many of you know, he has significantly changed the way sepsis is treated and recognized in New York. And he continues to raise awareness that uh, sepsis is one of the largest killer of children uh, in the world. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for putting all this together. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Kieran Saunton is my name. I'm here with my wife, Orla. In January 2013, New York became the first state in the United States to require mandatory sepsis protocols for the early detection and treatment of sepsis in every hospital. I've been asked here today to outline the process that the Rory Staunton Foundation went through to see these regulations enacted. Our family suffered a terrible tragedy on April the 1st, 2012, when our son Rory, at just 12 years of age, died from undiagnosed and untreated sepsis. Until our son's death, we had never heard the word sepsis. We learned that sepsis was the largest killer of children in the world, and that most people had never heard of it. Even worse, there was no national response to this epidemic. We set out to change the landscape forever. We established the Rory Staunton Foundation to raise awareness of sepsis and provide information to educate the public and save lives. What are Rory's regulations? In 2013, the foundation worked with healthcare experts in New York to draft Rory's regulations, a set of guidelines for the development of evidence-based sepsis protocols for hospitals, which include the screening and early recognition of patients with sepsis a process to identify and document individuals appropriate for treatment, guidelines for treatment, including delivery of antibiotics. Critically, these protocols must be submitted to New York State Department of Health for approval. Hospitals must also collect and submit all data on sepsis cases to the state for analysis so that the Department of Health can examine the effectiveness of the protocols and enforce changes where hospitals fall short. How do we go about getting those protocols adopted? First, we partner with the leading New York hospital system, Northwell Health, which has successfully reduced sepsis deaths in its own hospitals by 50% in five years through the use of its own protocols. We built a coalition of partners, even including stakeholders traditionally resistant to such regulations, and built a case for regulations. We allowed and this was a tough thing to do, very difficult. We allowed Rory's medical records to be made public. We compiled and presented the data on sepsis which showed that sepsis deaths were avoidable and that protocols did indeed save lives. New York State Department of Health drew from the experience of Northwell and other stakeholders and families, drew up Rory's regulations and sent them to Governor Andrew Cuomo for signing. The protocols also include a parents' bill of rights. On January the 29th, 2013, less than a year after Rory's death, the protocols were signed into law in New York State. Building on our success in New York, we knew that our work had just begun. In the months following the passage of Rory's regulations, we took our campaign for mandatory protocols nationally. We pushed hard for the CDC to take a long overdue action and devote time and resources to educating Americans about sepsis, resulting in a multi-year campaign targeting healthcare providers and the public. We succeeded in holding the first ever United States Senate hearing on sepsis. We also established the National Family and Council on Sepsis, a network of families impacted by the condition who are willing and eager to take action and fight for mandatory protocols in their own state. And we began the task, the ongoing task of traveling the country, educating legislators and health commissioners, and urging them to adopt Roy's regulations for their own constituents. In October 2017, Governor Andrew Cuomo signed Roy's education law into effect, providing comprehensive kindergarten to 12th grade sepsis education for 2 million school children in New York, and also 
also requiring that over 468,000 healthcare professionals in New York to complete mandatory sepsis training. So how do we measure our success? Numbers measure. The proof is in the numbers. To date, 42 million Americans are covered by mandatory sepsis protocols. Published reports utilizing data from, New data from New York State show that in the first 26 months alone, Rory's regulations were responsible for saving over 5,000 New York lives. Uh, just last month, for instance, a, Republic, a report published in the Journal of the Society of Critical Care Medicine showed that Rory's regulations have reduced pediatric mortality by 40% for sepsis patients. Lessons learned. Here are some of my advice for those who want to implement change in your own state or country. Build a coalition first and foremost. We're stronger when we're all together doing this. One has to go straight to the top. We went straight to the top. Arm yourself with the facts. The facts about sepsis are startling and that they deserve a strong response. And when people hear the stats, you definitely have their attention. The personal is powerful. Include the stories of people whose lives are shattered forever by this terrible condition. Don't take no for an answer because every place we went, we got some reason for no. And what we had to do was change the no into a yes. And that's what we've done in New York and other areas. And also, don't take the lead. The lead, don't, sorry, don't let others take the lead. Don't wait for others to take the lead. Because if we were waiting for others to take the lead, there would be no sepsis protocols. There would be no other initiatives. The proof is there. Sepsis regulations work. Roy's regulations have saved many lives. It's time for sepsis regulations worldwide. It's time. Time is now. It's not time down the years to come. Now is the time when we're going to start saving lives. I encourage everyone around the world to make protocol regulations your goal. Thank you very much. I believe we have questions now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Staunton. Um, I am actually curious to see how did you overcome some of the financial arguments uh, that something would be too expensive to implement, or did uh, was there financial support in New York for some of these um, implementations? Well, uh, very few people we met said, how much money is this going to cost when you compare it to the cost of a life? How much is just, what's the cost or the value of your son or daughter? There's no place we went that said, uh, we want to save lives, but we don't want to spend money. And also it shows and has been shown that the, the cost of readmittance uh, costs a lot more money than the cost of saving a life. So financial arguments did not become an issue anywhere. Okay. And... Um I guess I'm also impressed by the mandatory sepsis training. Uh, trying to get physicians to do anything on a mandatory basis uh, is pretty daunting. Um, and so uh, I applaud you uh, for uh, doing that. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll um, move on to our next speaker. We're actually running thank a little bit much. ahead of time. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Um, uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Ron Daniels. He's representing the UK Sepsis Trust. He is a consultant in critical care at the Heart of England National Health Service Foundation Trust in Birmingham. He's also chief executive officer of the Global Sepsis Alliance and chief executive of the charitable uh, UK Sepsis uh, Trust. He's been instrumental in implementing measures to trans form sepsis care across the UK and also the founder of several educational uh, sepsis uh, initiatives uh, in the UK. And he's going to be talking about raising awareness, the success they've had in the UK. Thank you so much. And it's a, a pleasure to be here and to help to uh, talk to you all about sepsis. My session really follows on nicely from Kieran Staunton's foundation. The, the strategies that the two organizers have taken in the United States and England have, have been really very similar. So I'm here to talk to you about what we've achieved in terms of driving national improvement across the National Health Service. I think the first thing that I would like to say, and uh, this has been touched on before, is that in order to persuade any government to act and in order to persuade health professionals to act, we have to have some understanding of data. And the problem with sepsis is that the data are frequently incomplete and often we don't know just how big a problem sepsis is. 
This is one of our premiership football stadiums. And we conservatively estimate at the moment that sepsis claims around 44,000 lives every year across the UK, which is more than breast cancer and bowel cancer and prostate cancer put together. But that's gleaned from the very basic sepsis codes, the, the standard codes. These codes here that you see, the codes that a clinical coder has recognized the term sepsis in the medical nose and recorded it as sepsis. Now, last year in England, that was around 200,000 cases. So across the UK, around 250,000 episodes. But we all know, including data from the CDC and then data also from the United Kingdom, that sepsis is undercoded. People are coded as the underlying diagnosis. So these people might be dying of multi-organ failure in intensive care units, but they're only coded as a pneumonia or a peritonitis or a cellulitis. And I was staggered to learn that last year in England, there were 1.7 million episodes of admission to hospital with one of those conditions. So what we can say really from coded data is there are between around 200,000 and 1.7 million episodes of sepsis and severe infection every year in the UK. And as we know from the UK and other data, it's rising. These data lead us to estimate that there are at least 44,000 deaths every year and likely nearer 80,000 deaths from sepsis every year. And we all know that we do, shouldn't talk about sepsis in a binary fashion. And this appeals to governments and policymakers as well as to members of the public. That yes, it's horrific if people die needlessly, but if we delay diagnosis, around 40% of survivors suffer at least one of this range of sequelae. And there's also a financial burden. We commissioned some independent work from a health economics consortium, and we identified that sepsis costs our national health service more to treat than asthma. Now we've got a government, now we've got the media sitting up and listening. But we also had to provide the professionals with their tools and their resources. And apologies for the typo on this screen, but what we identified is that health professionals need screening prompts and then they need treatment prompts as well as a simplified package of care with which to act. Now, the screening prompt that we used, we created uh, tools along with the Royal College of Physicians, and we have our national early warning score, which has now been rolled out across the National Health Service. And so the NHS recommends that health professionals think sepsis if the total national early warning score is five or higher, as well as in any patient in whom they have clinical suspicion. In terms of treatment prompts, of course, we know about the international consensus definitions for sepsis, but to a pressured junior doctor, junior nurse at the bedside, those international definitions, and even QSOFA, because the thresholds differ, were different from the new thresholds, were difficult to measure. So we worked with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, to put together a whole suite of tools for across the National Health Service. And you'll see there that we have tools for places as diverse as emergency departments, community services, and dental surgeries for all ages. And the treatment prompt, and this was not intended to be a new definition, it was a surrogate to encourage action, was, was there one red flag? Now, these red flags were things we were measuring across the NHS anyway, the parameters and the thresholds were identical to those in the early warning score. So if one of those was significantly deviated from normal, we encourage people to get on an act and treat as if the patient has sepsis and we can confirm the diagnosis later. And again, in terms of interventions, we developed back in 2006 the operationally deliverable tool, the sepsis 6. Six simple actions that when delivered together reduce the risk of dying by 100%. Though thus equipped, we set about how we could fix the system, and we recognized that we needed a combination of process changes, which had to be led by government officials, together with heightened public awareness in order to drive people to the healthcare system more quickly. So we worked with our now former Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, and he took sepsis really very seriously. And here he is in the House of Commons in Westminster, admitting that the NHS is inadequate at spotting sepsis. This was now a few years ago. So he put in place a number of measures. And again, we might see an analogy with Rory's regulations over in the United States. We don't need to read the detail of this side, but essentially all NHS hospitals were mandated to jump through three hoops. And if they jumped through the hoops, they got remunerated appropriately for sepsis. So hoop one, they had to screen eligible patients for sepsis. So anyone with a triggering national early warning score had to be screened. Hoop two was they had to deliver antimicrobials quickly. And hoop three was they had to demonstrate that they were reviewing antimicrobial appropriateness within 72 hours. So when this system came out, the, 
health professions were up in arms. They said, well, emergency departments are going to be giving antibiotics out to everybody who comes through the door just in order to meet these targets. And indeed, if you look at this table, that is to an extent what we saw. We saw 21% increase in ED use of antibiotics within one year following the implementation of these protocols. But if you look at the right-hand column, and you'll note in the lower two rows that there was a relative sparing of carbapenems and paracillin tazobactam. But if you look in the right-hand column, you'll see that the total consumption of antibiotics by hospitals went up very modestly. And when we consider that the throughput of patients through hospitals in that same time increased by nearly 6%, we can see that the per capita use of antimicrobials reduced. Therefore, we were front-loading the antibiotics Therefore, we conservatively estimate that every year now we're saving 3,000 more lives than we were previously. And we can see this in the run charts and the process charts. We can see here that our rate of screening for sectors across the whole country has increased by from 30% of patients being screened to 80% of patients being screened, sorry, 86% of patients being screened within the last two years. Similarly, rate of delivery of antimicrobials has increased from 32% up to 80%. Again, further data that the process is improving. And of course, as has been acknowledged previously, we understand that we have to use surrogates for mortality because we've had changing definitions, different people measure sepsis. If we rely on coded data, it's very much a surrogate. But the best estimates we've got have shown a stepped change in mortality data since we've implemented these processes. From a mortality rate in the right-hand um, axis there of 30% in a national confidential inquiry study back in 2015 to the government's own data from 2017 showing 25%, and then a recent analysis by Professor Sir Brian Jarman showing that mortality now drops to close on 20%. So we've seen improvements. We are saving significant numbers of lives. But as we all know, we can equip hospitals to deal with sepsis brilliantly, but if the patient is languishing at home for 48 hours, 72 hours before they present to healthcare, we're not going to see the mortality benefits as readily. So we've been working with agencies to heighten awareness of sepsis. And we don't have a government-funded campaign. So what we've been used to using is available resources. This is a very low budget, high intensity, high impact advertising campaign. We have 10 ambulance services across the United Kingdom. Now, six of them have sepsis messaging on every one of their vehicles in the whole fleet. And with there being circa 12,000 ambulances on our roads, that's a lot of very noisy yellow vans showing high visibility how important sepsis is. Our family doctor service, Out of Hours, is operated by state-funded cars, and there are 20,000 of these cars on the road, so we've been using these cars again. This is Professor Sir Bruce Keogh, the former medical director of the NHS, uh, with myself. You're looking at one of these 20,000 cars and they're highlighting how important it is that we get the message out there. And then there are, of course, and people in Europe will be familiar with an organization, JC Deco, who own a whole lot of large format LCD and LED advertising space across city centers. This is a relative, relatively small one on a bus shelter. But these companies have unsold space all the time, and we can use that unsold space with Public Health England's, with the NHS's blessing. You can just about see the NHS lozenge in the top right-hand corner there to use that space and to, for free, advertise to people in the cities. This is a slightly larger example across one of the major arteries into one of our cities, Birmingham, and we ran this campaign for a month. We can illuminate buildings. We work with corporate partners to disseminate the message further. And the message is consistently to equip the public, to empower them, to just ask, could it be sepsis? So these are all supported excuse me, <coughs> by Public Health England, by NHS England. They're supported by our Royal Colleges. And we are united in empowering our public to ask. More recent strategies, if we've been working with Transport for London and the tube train system to use those available spaces to, again, equip people with the knowledge and to empower them to ask, could it be sepsis? We're working with the Premier League and the Football Association. We've been working with our uh, Jockeys Association and our National Racing Association to further get the message out there. And one example is a partnership with a, a very high profile race we have in this country, watched by an international viewership of 16 million, at which we partnered with the organization, got the message out there.
And of course, we could use television. This is a medical drama watched by 5.1 million people every year. And we managed to get not only storylines into the program, but our posters into 27 consecutive episodes for a median screen time of 14 seconds for very little outlay. More recently, we've been working with a soap opera called Coronation Street. Now, Coronation Street is huge over here. It's got an internal viewership of 8.1 million viewers, very loyal. This young man that you can see in the middle of the screen there, a character by the name of Kevin Webster, we advised on set, we got the storyline just right, he had to undergo an amputation of his leg to save his life. So we now have a permanently running story in Coronation Street around the after effects of sepsis. And that will continue to keep public attention on this. And of course, to keep political attention on this. With the result that hopefully for World Sepsis Day this year, we'll have a very high profile announcement from our government that will deal with artificial intelligence and the examination of big data across the entire country with respect to sepsis. So that's what we've been doing over here in the UK. We are seeing mortality benefits. The conservative estimate is we're saving 3,000 lives every year. But looking at that stepped change of mortality surrogates, it's very likely as high as 10 to 15,000 more lives being saved every year through a combination of three things, heightened public awareness, policy change to encourage action, and providing the right tools to health professionals on the front line. We'll continue to do more of the same, and our aim has always been that we're going to be saving 14,000 more lives than we were in 2017 by the year 2022. So that's me done. Very happy to take any questions, should there be any. Um, and to reassure you, we will very happily share our resources with any countries who might be able to use them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniels. Uh, I'm very impressed that you could get uh, your campaign into a soap opera. So <laughs> there are a couple of questions here. Um, one question was about uh, whether you were suggesting, uh, in order to get more accurate data, whether patients with pneumonia should be coded as sepsis uh, first and then the underlying cause be pneumonia. <laughs> Well, yes, absolutely. And coding regulations in most countries would demand that we code the underlying causative um, source of infection first. And that's identical in the UK. But we are moving now toward a coding mechanism that if the patient has evidence of organ failure, then they, ca they should be coded as sepsis first with the underlying condition second. And we have now finally persuaded our Office for National Statistics, the, equi uh, one of the, uh, the equivalent of one of the functions of the CDC, to look at the first three diagnostic co codes rather than only the first. So I think it is important that we understand how coding works and how coding is reported before we can truly examine this problem. Okay. Um, another question uh, for you, and I can answer for the U.S. after you do, which is, can hospitals be penalized for negligence in cases of sepsis uh, in the U.K.? So hospitals are protected by Crown indemnity and um, NHS resolution. But yes, of course, they can be penalized. If there isn't a satisfactory conclusion through the state processes, then uh, people who've suffered harm are entirely entitled to seek litigation. And that's happening more and more. We're seeing anecdotal evidence from uh, firms of lawyers as well as from the media that litigation for failed care in the process of, uh, of sepsis is increasing significantly. That's an interesting driver for a health professional to, to get his or her head around. Um, but it, it, it is nonetheless a driver, and it's going to make healthcare systems continue to sit up and take notice. Um, thank you. In the United States, actually, hospitals can be penalized um, for failure to meet quality metrics. And so sepsis right now, there are no penalties, but we're all expecting this. But for other quality measures, basically, hospitals that do not meet them uh, will have a reduction in the payments they receive from uh, insurers. Uh, so it is a monetary incentive, um, more of a negative one than a positive one. Um, my, my apologies. I, I partly misunderstood your question. The, the three hoops I was talking about, if hospitals uh -huh. don't deliver, if they don't satisfy the criteria, they have to achieve 90% on each metric, then they have a reduction in their uh, tariffs for the following year. So that's another additional incentive. Um, I'm uh, president of the World uh, Federation of Intensive and Critical Care Society. So my question for you, you have done a wonderful 
campaign for awareness and utilized a lot of uh, very high tech uh, interventions. But what advice would you give for a low or middle income country as to what might be the most effective uh, means of raising awareness given the limitation of resources? We've talked about this with the World Health Organization, and, and most of us currently agree that in such countries where there aren't budgets for advertising campaigns, even if keep people could access the media to receive the advertising, Correct. that we have to look at at-risk groups, that we have to target populations, young children, pregnant mothers, particularly when there's been intervention, people who've undergone higher risk surgeries, and provide them and equip them with safety netting resources. In some countries and in some cultures, we can also engage the, the elders of the population, and they can be, they're often the the frontline surrogate health professionals in any case, and they can be educated. People in such countries, often literacy is relatively low, not always, but the use of pictograms and visuals is more important than words. So I think it would be difficult to give a blanket solution. I think this has to be designed by people on the ground who understand the culture of a country, the level of education, and the way in which messages will be well received. But I think safety netting for at-risk groups has got to be the way forward if resources constrained. Okay, and I have uh, one last question here for you. Um, uh, with your screening, uh, you're using the news. Is that primarily an electronic tool, or is that manual, or is it? How do you get people to be compliant? Uh, obviously, the easier it is, the more likely it is to be used. So, how is it being implemented in the UK? Well, we wish that it would be universally electronic because this this reduces human error, it reduces transcription error, it reduces edition error because, <laughs> believe it or not, that exists. Um, but the reality is that in only about 40% of NHS hospitals is physiological observation universally electronic. The majority of ambulance services run this and increasingly family doctors, we call them general practitioners, also have electronic systems that automatically calculate national early warning scores. But what we hope to do is to continue to drive policy change to incentivize creating incentives where we demand certain key performance indicators against the National Early Warning Score that make a burden of manual data capture too burdensome to resist the temptation to invest in electronic solutions is yeah. a slightly subversive strategy to ensure continued rollout. <laughs> okay, one last quick question that just came across, uh, asking if the participating ambulance companies are private or government-sponsored. So these are all state ambulance companies. So okay. uh, am ambulance services throughout the United Kingdom are provided through taxation. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. Appreciate your uh, knowledge and insight. Thank uh, you very much. Let's, let's go move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Luciano Acevedo, and he is representing the Latin American Sepsis Institute. He is head of the ICU and professor of critical care and emergency medicine at the University of Sao Paulo and the coordinator of the Intensive Care Research Program at the Instituto Sirio Libanes de Encino y Pesquisa in Sao Paulo. And he serves as the current president of the Latin American Sepsis Institute, known as LASI. And he is president of the Sao Paulo State Society of Critical Care. And he is going to share his uh, knowledge about the strategy and the achievements they've achieved uh, in Brazil. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this to this meeting. It's a, it's a pleasure to have to to be here to discuss the last achievements that we had in Brazil for the last years. And uh, let me just start saying that I, I am here representing the Latin America Sepsis Institute, which is a non-profit organization that aims to improve the care of sepsis in Latin American countries and mostly in Brazil. Um, this story starts in 2002 when we uh, run a, a clinical trial observational study showing that Brazil had a very large sepsis mortality. So for severe sepsis and septic shock, Brazilian mortality rates were uh, 50% or 55%. And this uh, 
these very very bad numbers called the attention of a group of intensivists and uh, infectious disease doctors that start the, the foundation of Latin American Sepsis Institute. LASI, which I'm going to call Latin American Sepsis Institute from now on, was founded in 2004 with the mission to aid in the quality improvement process for sepsis in Latin America by evidence-based protocol implementation and knowledge generation. Currently, LASI has three major branches of activity. So LASI has one uh, important arm of activity, which is quality improvement. So the aim of this, this branch is to reduce sepsis morbidity and sepsis mortality in Brazil and, and also in Latin America. We, we also try to understand the burden of sepsis by running clinical and epidemiological studies in Brazil and Latin American countries. And also the third aim, the third branch of LASI is to improve the awareness of sepsis among lay people and also among healthcare professionals. So we run a year national meeting. Uh, which has approximately 500 to 600 people every year, in, in mostly in Brazil. And we also run a lot of uh, strategies for improving the awareness of lay public in our country. So I will discuss briefly the three major branches, the three major arms of LASI uh, activities. As for the quality improvement project, LASI has been supportive and uh, endorsed the Surviving Sepsis Campaign guidelines from the very beginning of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. And now uh, LASI also has a branch of an activity of uh, training hospitals in Brazil. We have trained now more than 150 hospitals all over the country in, 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 in Brazil. And these hospitals are training in quality improvement initiatives with a periodic reports and benchmarking with other hospitals aiming to reduce the morbidity and mortality of sepsis in their institutions. This culminated with the publication of a recent paper in Critical Care Medicine where LASI demonstrated their, uh, uh, their results. We had for this paper more than 21,000 patients in our data bank and now in, in 2018, LASI has more than 60,000 patients in our database. So it's a major initiative to benchmarking and to improve collaborative uh, resources and to uh, uh, aid these hospitals in quality improvement and in, in, in our country, in Brazil. Also, LASI has a dedicated website where the, 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 the institutions can find the materials of uh, these campaigns, so all the protocols, all the folders, all the the suggestions of LASI by uh, for for the treatment of septic patients can be found in our website, which is of course translated in Portuguese and also translated in Spanish for people in in in, in Latin America. The other major initiative of Latin American Sepsis Institute is to understand the burden of sepsis in Brazil. Together with this, the first paper, which was published in 2004 in Critical Care Forum, we have published a lot of studies understanding the costs of sepsis in, in Brazilian institutions, showing that uh, the, the cost of sepsis is much more pronounced in, in, in public hospitals in, in our country. We also uh, made a study, a survey, evaluating the knowledge of sepsis in Brazil regarding intensive care and emergency department physicians and show that, especially for emergency department physicians, the, the understanding, the perception, the awareness of sepsis was very low in Brazilian uh, doctors, demonstrating the needs of uh, national meetings and educational tools to improve the, 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 the awareness of sepsis along uh, uh, physicians in our country. And also, we have published our, our quality improvement initiatives, such as the, 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 the periodic report of SLASI, such as the publication in, in 2017 in, in critical care medicine. Uh, a recent uh, clinical study that LASI conducted was the so-called SPREAD study. In the SPREAD study, we understood the burden of uh, ICU sepsis in Brazil. Uh, 
We demonstrated that, for instance, in a point prevalence analysis, the prevalence of sepsis in our country was 30%, with a very high mortality rate of 55%. This is for 2014. So it's interesting that from 2002, which was the first uh, collection of data on sepsis epidemiology in Brazil, from 2002 to 2014, the mortality rate for sepsis, at least in our uh, uh, in country, was very high, with data from uh, 50 to 55 percent in, in in Brazil. The the third activity that LASI uh, does is the awareness, as I as I mentioned early. So the awareness is intended to improve the perception of sepsis among the public and also among the 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 healthcare professional. So for the healthcare professionals, we run a year uh, year yearly uh, international forum which has 500 to 600 professionals. And then for the lay public, we run we we run a uh, 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 intervention, uh, uh, a pool with, with interviews, Amy, for instance, to, in 2014, Amy, for instance, to, uh, 2,000 people in several uh, cities of, of Brazil. And we demonstrated that, for instance, the awareness of sepsis among the public in Brazil is very low, mostly when we when we compare it with acute myocardial infarction. As you can see, uh, uh, the mortality uh, rate of the, 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 the awareness of sepsis among uh, lay public is 7% in Brazil in 2014. And in, in for acute myocardial infarction, the awareness is 98%. 98 of the Brazilians have heard of a, an acute myocardial infarction. So, uh, the aim of this branch of LASI activities is to improve the awareness of sepsis by doing advertising in media, by doing campaigns during World Sepsis Day, uh, also known advertising on, on, on our website of World Sepsis Day website, also known on social media. We have a Facebook page which is composed by uh, more than, than 50,000 followers on our Facebook page. So for the World Sepsis Day in Brazil. So the next 13th of uh, September, we're going to have a lot of activities in our country, including media, including, uh, including social media, and also including uh, live activities in several spots in, in several cities of, of Brazil. Also, in, as a, as a, as a, an idea and as a strategy of awareness and education for uh, healthcare professionals. We had some partnership with National Councils of Medicine and, and Nursery, and we run uh, books. So we, we did books with these this conscious, and these books were dis distributed uh, free of charge for all physicians and all, all nurses in Brazil, so they can they could understand the, the issue, the problems of sepsis in our country. As I mentioned before, we also have a, a national sepsis forum, which is run every year, mostly in May or June in Brazil. So we invited international speakers and and national speakers, the most important speakers in, in Brazil and in Latin America, to participate in the in our international sepsis forum. And also a very good initiative of of Brazil is to uh, increase the do partnerships with academic associations, academic societies of, of several medical and non-medical specialties, and also with also with councils of medicine and also other other professionals. So these are uh, we have LASI has several uh, supporters, several uh, partners in, in in Brazil, so we can improve our disseminate our capacity of dissemination of sepsis message in Brazil and also in Latin America. LASI is also uh, internationally inserted, for instance, in Global Sepsis Alliance and, for instance, in International Sepsis Forum. So this also helps in bringing, in bringing international guests to our, to our sepsis forum and also to spread the, the importance of sepsis in Brazil and also in Latin America. 
So to conclude, sepsis is still a major healthcare issue in Brazil. However, the activities of Latin America Sepsis Institute have contributed to increase the awareness of sepsis in, in, in our country among lay public and among healthcare professionals, and also to improve the mortality, as we can see in LASI periodic reports, which are available, for instance, in our website. However, we still need more efforts uh, to improve sepsis awareness and to improve sepsis care in Brazil. As I mentioned, the mortality rate for sepsis in our country is still very high, and we also need more political insertion so sepsis can be considered a healthcare priority in our country. So again, I would like to thank you very much for inviting Latin American Sepsis Institute for this meeting, and I'm open to uh, reply the questions wherever you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Acevedo, and we do have a few questions. So one question that came through from the uh, audience was whether there is a sepsis protocol that must be followed by the hospitals in Brazil. Uh, actually, LASI has, we, we, we suggest, we have some suggestions of protocols that these hospitals can implement, which are mostly based on surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. But of course, uh, these hospitals can also tailor, they, they can also customize their, their, uh, uh, their protocols to whatever conditions they have in, 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 in their, in their environment, if you can say that. For instance, Brazil has, a very different profiles of hospitals. We have public hospitals which are very busy in the emergency department, and we have uh, patients that arrive very early or very late for these public hospitals during the course of their disease. And we also have private hospitals which uh, have less busy emergency departments, and uh, we, the, 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 the relationship of nurse, the staff, and patients, for instance, in these in, the, in these private hospitals, is much better than in the public ones. So uh, uh, the, the the facility to to do adequate triage of sepsis in these private institutions is much more is much easier than in the public hospitals. So, for instance, uh, LASI suggests some triage strategy and also uh, uh, how to accomplish with surviving sepsis guidelines. But these hospitals can also tailor, customize these these uh, these suggestions to their reality. Thank you. Uh there was also a comment that came in between the last presentation and yours, and I just, I'll adapt it here for you, which is um, the recommendations about using QSOFA as screening. And I've, I know Dr. Machado and I have had discussions about that, and I know the passion here, but what are you recommending for screening uh, in Brazil? This is a great question. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we are, uh, we have different scenarios of hospitals. For instance, uh, if you are in a public hospital, a very busy emergency department hospital with, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of patients and a, a very unfavorable nurse or staff patient ratio, it's very difficult to, to start the triage, for instance, with uh, serious criteria, right? Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of people with serious uh, and not with sepsis, and it's very difficult to triage all these patients, to screen all these patients uh, for, for sepsis. So uh, one of our suggestions is for these busy emergency departments to start the triage with uh, one dysfunction criteria, but not with quick sofa, which, uh, of course, you know, uh, has needs to be two positive criteria to, to be a uh, quick sofa positive patient. So one alternative strategy for us not to uh, identify the patients too late in these public hospitals is to start with only one dysfunction, clinical available dysfunction, for instance, uh, uh, acute uh, alteration in consciences or uh, acute hypotension or respiratory failure. Or, on the other hand, if you are in an in a emergency department, which is not very busy, so you can start uh, and you have a far, favorable uh, staff uh, patient ratio. We have a more staff uh, compared to the number of patients. You can start uh, screening with a CIS criteria, for instance, and then look for the dysfunction with laboratory data and, 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 and start all the, all the triage process in this, in this scenario. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll move on to uh, our last speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Manuel Sudebu. I'm 
pardon me if that's not pronounced correctly, but he's representing the African Sepsis Alliance, um, and he is a consultant and in infectious disease physician at the Tropical and Infectious Disease Unit of the Royal Liverpool Hospital, and is also a member of the Faculty of Public Health. He's the clinical lead for the Sepsis Time is Life Project at the Royal Liverpool Hospital and also the co-lead for a regional sepsis improvement collaborative in the northwest of England. But he's going to talk to us today about the challenges to increase sepsis awareness in Africa. Um, good, good, good afternoon and, um, and, and, and uh, thank you um, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm Emmanuel Sutebu and Chair of the African Sepsis Alliance and it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for having invited me and other members of the African Sepsis Alliance to present at this um, great Congress. Um, although I'm calling from Liverpool and uh, presenting from Liverpool, I'm originally from Cameroon and I'll probably start by greeting you in an African um, language, which is Swahili, by saying Jambo. And so you're all uh, very welcome. I'm going to be talking about the challenges to increased sepsis awareness in, in Africa. And it's going to be split into two, really, initially talking about the reasons why we should focus on sepsis in Africa, and then I'll talk to you about what the African Sepsis Alliance is doing. So first, why, and then what. So why focus on sepsis in Africa? If you imagine this lady on the slide, the picture here, a, a lady in rural, presenting in rural Africa, with pneumonia and um, low blood pressure, and, and say for the purpose of this presentation, blood pressure of 60 systolic, and you can see how she's drowsy and, and finding it difficult to stand, and um, the healthcare workers here are uh, resuscitating, resuscitating her with fluids. She's also got an acute kidney injury, so you would say she's got pneumonia and, and sepsis. Now, the chance of survival for this lady in rural part of Africa is probably around 20% in most parts of Africa. And that really is the problem, that everybody in Africa also has a right to survive um, sepsis as um, you do in other parts of the world. So what we've got at the moment is the African continent, which has the highest burden of disease for infection, and by extrapolation, I'm aware that we don't know the burden of disease of sepsis in Africa, but we have we know that the burden of disease for infection is highest in Africa. And at the same time, the large scale sepsis improvement activities are not happening in in that part of the world. So we've got an imbalance of burden of disease as and compared to um, sepsis large scale sepsis improvement activities, and that is what we are trying to um, resolve as part of the African Sepsis Alliance. So just to go through the reasons why sepsis in Africa, we feel, is different from other parts of the world and why we need to focus and tackle it from a, in a different way. The first is because patients tend to present late. Um, late presentation is, a, is, a, is an issue in high-income countries, but it's even a bigger issue in low- and middle-income countries because of trans difficulties with transportation, because of poverty. And um, so patients tend to present late when they're more severely ill. There are also problems with malnutrition and HIV infection, which means they're more likely to, to um, succumb, um, outcomes are likely to be worse. Because of HIV infections, there are studies that have described different pathogens as cause of causes of sepsis in, in Africa, um, such as non-typhoidal salmonella, bacteremia, um, microbacterium tuberculosis also being a cause of, of sepsis, especially in high HIV um, prevalence countries, and zoonosis, such as um, uh, um, le leptospirosis and rickettsial infections. The healthcare system is also um, weaker with limited resources, and so the system um, systems aren't as aren't well designed to look after severely uh, ill patients with um, with infections, which is essentially sepsis. In addition to that, um, Africa has the youngest uh, the continent with the youngest population in the world, with um, less than with over 60%, about 60% of people being under the age of 25 
and sepsis and infections affect this group more than, than the other groups. In Europe and in North America, it's the older population that's affected by, 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 by sepsis. In Africa, it's a younger population. So there's a disproportionate n um, number of years of life lost as a result of, of sepsis. Access to critical care is also um, a problem. There have been studies, for example, in, in, in Africa, in the court example of Uganda, um, reporting one access, access to intensive care beds of one bed per one million uh, members of the population, which compared to about 100 per million population in, in the Western world. So we, importantly, we need to focus on identifying and treating these patients quite early because if they get to intensive, they can't, they don't have access to intensive care and the outcomes tend to be also poor when they get to intensive care in this part of the world. There are also high rates of resistance, antimicrobial resistance in low middle income countries in Africa specifically, such as MRSA and, and extended spectrum and beta lactamase um, producing gram negatives. And there is less focus on antimicrobial stewardship. And, um, and so we feel that we need to actually tackle these sepsis and antimicrobial stewardship hand in hand and maybe even do stewardship before uh, sepsis improvement because if we don't, we'll run into serious problems with antimicrobial resistance um, if we don't strengthen stewardship at the same time as sepsis improvement. So we have a, a part of the world where sepsis is probably most common. Um, where outcomes are probably worse, and we have also limited data from, from Africa. And there are specific questions which we need an answering from Africa. The burden of disease and the outcomes, uh, we, we don't know, and we need to, 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 to um, uh, describe that. We also, as highlighted by other speakers, need a definition for sepsis, which is practical and which healthcare workers can use in that setting. The new sepsis definition, sepsis three consensus definitions really are not um, applicable in this part of the world. We also need to understand optimal treatment strategies and can't assume that treatment strategies that work in the Western world also work in Africa. And that has been highlighted, for example, with fluid resuscitation in, in Africa, where we found with the FEAST study in children and in the most recent Andrew study in adults in Zambia, that bolus fluid resuscitation actually led to worse outcomes. So we need to understand why and also develop mac um, optimal fluid resuscitation strategies for Africa. And we also need to, to test and try quality improvement interventions in Africa to, de to determine what works in, in, in our continent. So, and that is really why the African Sepsis Alliance was formed in 2016 by um, some of my colleagues, um, Kamal Osman and um, Halima from Nigeria, Kamal from Sudan, to drive and lead sepsis improvements in Africa. And we joined um, last year to strengthen it. And our mission is that everybody in Africa has a right to survive sepsis. And we provide leadership to reduce mortality and suffering for sepsis in Africa. And that is really what we're, we're setting out to achieve. Now, what have we done? I'm moving on now to what have we done? Last year, we held the first African sepsis uh, symposium in Kampala, Uganda, in the middle of the African Federation of Critical Care Nurse um, uh, Conference, and was supported by the Global Sepsis Alliance and the World Federation of Critical Care Nurses. And it was an excellent opportunity to meet and discuss the issues related to sepsis improvement in Africa. And at the end of it, we produced what is referred to as the Kampala Declaration, which was a statement describing the um, important issues that need to be just addressed for sepsis in Africa and making some recommendations. And it's available from the African Sepsis Alliance um, website. We, there were some specific points raised which I want to highlight. The first is that within Africa, we need to focus on strengthening health services for patients with severe illness. And that's, we couldn't, we can't improve sepsis on its own. We need to focus on strengthening health services for severe illness and sepsis being part of, a part of the, of, a, of, of the spectrum of severe illnesses. Secondly, because of the absence of critical care services and the outcomes, we need to focus on pre-critical care for patients in Africa, identifying patients very early and treating them appropriately in order to avoid 
critical care admissions and improve outcomes. And lastly, that sepsis improvement was part of the sustainable development goals and that all countries in Africa really need to develop a strategy and action plan for sepsis improvement in line with the WHO resolution. The Kampala resolution and Kampala declaration um, was published as a petition and we had over 3,500 people around the world signing the petition, who signed the petition from over 100 countries. Uh, um, in 2018, February, we met in Sudan, and the Sudanese Sepsis Alliance hosted a conference um, within, within in Khartoum, which was um, well attended, and we officials from the Global Sepsis Alliance and the African Sepsis Alliance at attended. It was over, they had over 500 um, uh, member, um, healthcare workers provided education and training, but this conference was chaired by um, Professor Mamoun, the Khartoum Minister of Health, and at the end of it, we produced the Khartoum Resolution, which was a commitment from the um, from Professor Mamoun and the and the Khartoum Minister, Ministry of Health to um, host a, a Africa-wide um, conference, host and sponsor an Africa-wide conference to discuss of Ministers of Health to discuss uh, sepsis improvement in Africa and, and produce a joint strategy. And we're hoping that we'll take this forward with Professor Mamoun and the Khartoum Minister of Health. Now, in Africa, we have 54 countries, and Sudan is by far the most, has the strongest uh, sepsis alliance led by um, Dr. Um, Kamal Osman, with the Minister of Health being involved. Medical students also have their own sepsis uh, alliance in Sudan, and also the patients involved. We also plan to launch uh, an, an alliance in Kenya in October, on the 4th of October 2018, when we meet for the second African Sepsis Alliance Symposium. And Nigeria, the Nigerian um, uh, Infectious Disease Society has also formed a sub subcommittee, multidisciplinary subcommittee, to coordinate the sepsis improvement activities in Nigeria. And what we would like to do is ensure that all these other countries that are starting activities also develop strong um, uh, sepsis alliances just like Sudan. Now, this is quite a significant um, um, next step, I think, for sepsis improvement in Africa. The Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine has led a grant application um, led by um, Jamie Rylands and Shevin Jacobs, who are also members of the African Sepsis Alliance, in collaboration with the African Sepsis Alliance, and they have successfully had funding um, from the National Institute for Health Research in the UK, so sum of two million pounds for research over three years, targeting non-pregnant um, patients with sepsis, uh, adults sepsis in Africa. And it's called the African Research Collaboration on Sepsis. It's a major achievement. And the key output is going to be to develop, uh, do a study to describe um, the incidence of sepsis in Africa, the out and the outcome, prognostic markers and outcomes. So there'll be a short incident study with three um, centers in Gabon, Malawi, and in Uganda, and other sites in Africa as part of the African Sepsis Alliance use those sites to, to describe the incidence of sepsis in Africa and outcomes. We also plan to use a Delphi process to identify a quality of care indicators for sepsis in, in Africa, and also test some improvement ideas um, as a result, and use test whether autosound scan can be used to guide fluid resuscitation for patients in, in, in Africa, given the difficulties or the um, uh, odd results that we've had, we've had in children and adults with bolus fluid resuscitation in Africa. So this is quite a significant um, next step, and I'll, I'll, I'll urge you to watch out for the results. Now, we are very keen on improving public awareness in, in, in Africa. The truth is that we simply do not know what the level of, uh, of awareness amongst members of the public and healthcare workers is, and we need to ascertain that. You've heard about studies that have shown the level of awareness in other parts of the world, in Germany, in Brazil, as you've just heard. We simply do not know that in Africa. And we plan to do a similar survey using a polling um, company to describe the level of awareness of sepsis in Africa and use that as a baseline to understand what improvement needs to be done and what are the areas that we need to focus on. We suspect in Africa it's going to probably be less than 1% in terms of level of awareness amongst members of the public. 
So our priorities in the next uh, 12 months is to de determine the level of awareness and run an advocacy, uh, advocacy campaign, which will be focused on patients and also healthcare workers. And we plan to involve politicians. So focus on members of the public and involve uh, patients and politicians. We also have a, a second African sepsis symposium, which will be held on the 4th of October in Mombasa, Kenya. And um, all the presentations from the symposium are going to be um, made available online and free of charge access for healthcare workers around the world, including Africa. And this is being done in collaboration with a company called MedReach, which is based in Scotland, who are not only um, filming the conference and making it available online, but also donating um, some of the um, resources from a, another conference that they are hosting towards the African Sepsis Alliance, which I think is, is really um, something to applaud. We also um, plan to work with the WHO and other stakeholders to develop guidelines and use the results of the ARC um, collaboration, which I've just mentioned, in order to feed into, into guidelines. But most importantly, we want to strengthen um, sepsis improvement activities in all African countries. The stronger we have African um, alliances within countries, then the, the, the more successful the African sepsis alliance is going to be. We're starting off with Sudan, Kenya, and Nigeria, but we want to strengthen as many countries as we can in the next 12 months. So I'd like to finish there by thanking you and referring you to the African Sips Alliance website for more information and also if you want to get in contact with us. And there are also some publications here which you can also access which describe what the African Sepsis Alliance is doing and why sepsis in Africa is important. Thank you. I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we have uh, just a little bit of time left uh, for a couple of questions. Um, you outlined a lot of needs um, from public awareness, uh, clinician awareness, need for data, need to determine intervention. So in your opinion, where would be the biggest improvement uh, if you only had limited resources? What do you think is the most cr crucial first step? I think the first crucial first step is um, to focus on health care workers. And first is determining the level of awareness of sepsis, but also developing education programs for healthcare workers. Um, and that would involve using social media, because social media, most people in Africa have smartphones and access social media. So we can target um, healthcare workers through social media, but also make available tr online training which uh, is a, which should be available for healthcare workers, and that is the, what we're starting with the symposium in Mombasa, which will be filmed and put online for healthcare workers to access. And so okay, I think that's next. really where we can start in terms of of the African research um, collaboration on sepsis. I think is also an, imp an important next step, really, to describe what are the indicators for quality of care for sepsis in Africa through a Delphi process and then use that to develop um, guidelines. And actually there was a question very similar to that one that came across just now so that your answer was perfect. Um, I'm uh, wondering how are you um, going to overcome a lot of the uh, both language and cultural barriers? That is it's a very important, important uh, question. Um, there are 54 countries in Africa, so it's ambitious for us to think we can do this across the continent because it's not one country, it's 54 countries, and even within the countries, a lot of diversity. And that is really why we need individual um, alliances to be strong, like, like Sudan, to be able to develop their own material tailored to their own needs. Uh, so they can it can target um, they can target it to their own population and um, make it as effective as possible. So we 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 expect to develop some generic ma material, uh, but we're really expecting individual countries to make the material specific and tailor it according to their languages, their their culture. Um, we also need to be quite clear, and we've discussed this in, in our, within the Afghan Sips Alliance, about what are the key messages that we want to give across in, in Africa. And we haven't yet done that. We have realized, we, we recognize that it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an area we need to focus on. Other um, 
parts of the world like the UK have developed messages like um, could it be sepsis? We have to within uh, for, for for the African sepsis line determine what are the key messages that we want to to put across in Africa, and then um, um, gen- to develop the messages and then let individual countries tweak it or tailor it to their own liking. Uh, excellent. So I, we heard earlier about the World Health Organization, the clean hands. How how's, how's that campaign been going in Africa? And are you collaborating with that um, message as well? We are. And um, we did that this year when we had the clean hand um, campaign. We promoted it, um, used the African Subsidized Network, which has over 70 clinicians around over across 15 countries. So we use that to disseminate the information from the WHO. And we also know that Africa has an infection control network. And so they are the primary um, network that's used to disseminate information. But we very much work hand in hand. And they are also members of the African Sepsis Alliance. And, and so we, we collaborate with them. But we promoted the message through our own network um, because it's, Sepsis prevention is is a, is also a key part of our objectives. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate uh, your uh, sharing your knowledge with us this afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. So this uh, concludes uh, our session, and I'd like to thank all of the speakers uh, for their participation and sharing some very important message about the international. Uh, status of uh, sepsis around the world and sharing their suggestions on how to improve quality for everyone. Um, we also would like to encourage you to participate in the Global Sepsis Alliance Quality Measure Survey, which is on the website and you can see on the slide uh, in front of you. It should only take eight to ten minutes, I'm told. So if you have an opportunity, uh, please go to the website. And of course, their website has a lot of additional information and resources for you as well. Uh, And lastly, but uh, most importantly, uh, we need to uh, thank all of the sponsors uh, for the entire Sepsis World Congress, in addition to BioMuro, who exclusively sponsored this session. So thank you so much for your participation uh, and attention uh, uh, today. (laughs) Thank you. And we'll sign off for now. Thanks.